I want to start with this image of uh, this hippie guy going out to the San Geronimo Day at the Pueblo at a, maybe 1967. There's thousands of people out there now on that day, but uh, back then there was just a couple hundred. And uh, here this guy walks in, he's got the hair down to his waist, and uh, nobody had seen anything like that. The only people out there at that time that had long hair were the real old men or the young boys that were in the kiva. And no, no white guys, you know, definitely no white guys. This guy was one of the bouncers uh, at the Fillmore West out there in San Francisco, and he was uh, one of those really, really first hippies, you know. That was a time back then people were taking LSD and having, uh, you know, experience of opening up with a greater uh, aesthetic, uh, you know, sensibility and uh, a, an ecological sensibility. Uh, you know, uh, LSD allowed us to have a really good bullshit detector, too. These hippies were all opened up, and but uh, what do we do? We don't have any models, you know. And here these old men, uh, you know, had been doing this for a number of years, plus they had a tradition behind it. You know, they taught us respect for our experiences. Back then, you know, when people reported their experiences with these substances, they would use a religious metaphors to have respect for this experience we were having, the respect for the medicine that we were using, the, this peyote, this plant that grows from Mother Earth, and respect for all the people that have gone before us, the respect for the people who had uh, uh, developed these ways, you know, and uh, come up with these songs and uh, this uh, way of doing these ceremonies. So they taught us how to pray, you know. The whole thing was such a revelation to us hippies. Most of us had been brought up in, uh, you know, religious contexts for which we had no more respect for them. Hierarchical, monotheistic religions where somebody sits at the front of the room and tells you how to behave. So very different from uh, people who pray in circles, in a, in a teepee or a hogan. Or it's a, it was a very, very beautiful thing and a very big uh, mind opener for everyone, I think. You know, it's just not me. There's a, no, a whole number of people here that uh, were really heavily influenced by these men. So I'd like to mention these men's names right now, you know. So Little Joe and uh, John Gomez and uh, Little Joe's son Henry and, and John's son Tommy. Then there was uh, Tell Us Good Morning and uh, Joe Sandoval, also known as Sunhawk, and uh, Frank Zamora. So they're all passed away. They're all passed away. A little Joe Gomez, now he was a guy I was most involved with, him and his brother John, who were really amazing people. And these guys were very respected because they were like the old-time Indians. They had long hair, they wore blankets, they, they dressed traditional ways. You know, they were pretty tr traditional. So they were uh, respected all, all over in these dis different reservations. You know, they would go over to the Navajo Reservation or they'd go uh, to the Ute Reservation or they'd go to Oklahoma. Oklahoma was kind of the, the center of uh, the Native American church. Back then, that's where it was coming from. To me, it was like, okay, this is the way people are supposed to do it. Uh, people, this is the way people are supposed to be. In the 60s, uh, we were able to see through a, a lot of the hypocrisies in our culture, through the lens of uh, you know the, the Vietnam War and the civil rights movement and all the things that came out of the 60s, all the... You know, all the bullshit that we saw through, what do we judge our actions against, uh, the, the planet or, uh, you know, or just or are we just here to service our debt? So I'm thinking about a peyote meeting we had at Buckland Flats outside of uh, Santa Fe, and that's probably 1968, 69, perhaps. Back then it was uh, bare land out there. Now it's very, very expensive homes. But after, the, after being up all night and, you know, trying hard, putting out our energy good, singing those good songs and uh, great music and uh, prayers and all these things all, all wrapped up and it's over with. We've left the teepee and then we go back in and we can hang out in there and drink some coffee and smoke some cigarettes and you know, have, maybe have some rolls or something like that. But uh, having a good time gossiping. And uh, it comes up uh, that the, the church is running out of medicine. So it's suggested that since I have a f fairly new pickup truck, that I go down to uh, the border along the, the border, down around, uh, around Laredo on the Rio Grande and uh, get a load of medicine. So my neighbor up there in Lama, Stephen Hinton, who was raised down there in the Mexican mining camps, right down in that area, he and I and little Joe are going to go down and uh, get medicine. Little Joe's son, uh, Henry cuts our hair, 
So we're going to Texas, you know, it's kind of, we're kind of scared of Texas. It's enemy territory. So we cut our hair and he takes us down to the river and puts the hair in the river and prays over it. And then uh, we get ready to go. Well, even though Joe's known all over the West, he doesn't have any papers. He doesn't even have a card in the Native American church. We have some papers for the North American Church of God, which is uh, the one here in, in New Mexico, but it's never been tested. No one's ever had to show it to anybody. But we have those papers with us, so we, we go down there. We go traveling through Texas, and we start eating medicine right when we leave town. And it gets pretty cosmic every time we stop somewhere to get gas or something. It seems like we're uh, right there in the in metaphysical background of the world to stop and to take a piss. It's uh, all very cosmic. So we're going to a town, Roma, which is right on the border, and the road runs right along the river. So there's uh, one side of the road, uh, there's uh, the, the Rio Grande, the other side is houses. Uh, so Joe and John Gomez have been going down there for uh, years, and they know a woman there that uh, has a, some property outside of town that ha where a lot of peyote grows. So we go to her house and get the, the key. We go out, it's just getting dusk, we unlock the gate, we get in, Joe's out there looking for peyote plants, and we make a, a fire and cook up some f food. And so he cuts some peyote, we eat some peyote that night, and, and we go to sleep. Joe sleeps with his head right on a, a bunch of peyote plants so they can talk to him. We get up early the next morning and uh, start to uh, cut the medicine and eat some too. So I, the first ones I eat are about as big as a quarter. I just bend down and I bite him off, right, without even touching him, just bite him off. A peyote plant will grow back, but then when the top's cut off, uh, it'll grow back in a circle. So the medicine's working on us, and we get more and more familiar with the ecology there, which is everything has has stickers on it and thorns except for the peyote. And the only creatures we see are spiders, which have these uh, webs in between the mesquite trees, and, and uh, there's tortoises, too, around. That medicine starts to, you know, soften us up to that ecology, and it looks like the peyote's talking to us. It calls us over. We, you know, we don't know how, but it'll call us over. We'll see a plant. When it's almost as if the plants are like searchlights, putting out uh, rays of energy, and we're in communication. I see a plant, and it's like it sees me too. It's a, the consciousness is going both ways. Yeah, that night was really great. We were out right there, right in the in the gardens, that's what the Indians call those places down there, the, the peyote gardens. So we're sitting there at night and, you know, we got burlap bags of peyote sitting around us and we're, we have our drum out and a rattle and we're singing there. It's very beautiful. Uh, the insects are singing too. and Right there in the, ma the magic place where the, where the peyote's growing. It uh, feels like we're kneeling on flesh. That's what the, the ground feels like at that point. So the next morning, we go into town and give the woman her key back, and uh, the whole bed of that truck is uh, full of uh, burlap bags of peyote. So we go back into town, find a place where we can go down to the river and swim and get cleaned up, and we're going to go home that night, drive all the way home, and uh, we go into uh, Mexico. We cross the border to have dinner. The border crossing there is just a footbridge. It's this uh, narrow bridge and uh, had a, a string of electric lights reflecting in the water. To me, it looks like uh, Japanese lanterns. Well, we go in and we have dinner and uh, we're coming back and uh, across the bridge and there's two U.S. custom agents on the American side. I said, well, are you, are you American citizen? Yeah, well, do you have proof? Well, me and Steve had uh, New Mexico driver's license. That's all you needed at that time. But uh, we knew Joe didn't have anything. He didn't have a wallet. He didn't have any cards. He didn't have a driver's license. A uh, hundred yards away is a, a truck f full of peyote. So they see Joe. They say, uh, okay, here's the little old medicine man. Is, is he a citizen? And uh, Joe just sort of looked at him. And, uh, you know, with a, it's kind of a little bit of nervousness, but a little bit of humor. He he picked up one of his long braids and held it up as a, a sign of his uh, American citizenship since he was a indigenous American Indian.